the first race of this 20th IAAF World Cross Country Championships, the Women's Junior Championships, four kilometers. They'll run out of the start and then one lap around the course. And of course, Kenya, the defending champions with the defending individual champion back in Lydia Chiromai, only 13 when she won the race last year, and she is back again. She did win the Kenyan trials and is the defending champ. Actually, she didn't win the Kenyan trials. It was Pamela Chepchumba, who there's some question as to her age, whether she's 12 or 13 years old. Catherine Karuai, uh, who was sixth last year for Kenya, is also back. Kenya won last year with 18 points over Ethiopia with 40 and Japan with 43. And it will be interesting to see how the conditions affect this race here. Paula Radcliffe of Great Britain closing in on the finish line in the women's junior race. Behind her, Wang Zhanzhou, number 52 of China. Radcliffe took the lead halfway through the race after Wang had led the first mile. And she looks as if she will be able to hold on. The Kenyan influence in third place now as the defending champion struggles to hold on to third place. But it will be Paula Radcliffe of Great Britain winning the women's junior race. Wang Zhanzhou of China. And then it will be the defending champion, Linda Chiromai of Kenya just edging out. Jennifer Clegg from Great Britain coming in fourth. So some surprises in the women's junior race. Final results now in the women's race. Paula Radcliffe the winner by five seconds over Xinxia Wang of China with Linda Chiromai of Kenya, the defending champion, finishing third. Ready now for the men's junior championships. They are on the line and actually over the line as the horn goes off. The footing on the course deteriorating. The sun has come out, the snow has stopped falling and this will soften up the course and perhaps make the mud even more of a problem. This race, 8,000 meters, three loops around Bear Cage Hill and through the stadium. And as you mentioned, the footing a problem, the race 7,800 meters, a little less than five miles in distance, and the Kenyan team is favored. They won a year ago with 19 points, beating the Ethiopians and the Tanzanians. All right, the Kenyans returning two of their four scorers from last year. They are the favorites. The men's junior race will be a runaway for Ismael Karui, who took the lead just past halfway and just continued to pull away from his teammate, Josephat Machuka. Karui, the brother of Richard Cholimo, with a very convincing win here in the junior race. Cholimo was fifth in the men's senior race. Karui, his younger brother, finished a runner-up to Chalimo in the World Junior Championships, 10,000 meters in 1990. He's only 17 years old. His younger sister was also in the junior women's race today. Karui was fourth in this event in 90, seventh in 91, and now he moves up to the top spot. Just behind him, a tough battle for second place between Haile Selassie of Ethiopia. Selassie now in second place, Machuka in third. But the winner will be Ismael Karui of Kenya, an easy victor. Second place will be Selassie of Ethiopia and then Joseph Machuka of Kenya. Final results in the men's junior race show Karui an easy winner. Yasuki Watanabe of Japan, the first non-African in the top eight. And the evidence of Kenyan dominance in the team score, almost a perfect score for the Kenyan men's junior team. Very nice. okay, you guys go straight down. 
They are entering the starting gates for the senior women 6,000 meter World Cross Country Championships here. And Lynn Jennings, the two time defending champion, getting in her final strides on what will be a snow covered course here in Franklin Park in Boston. She will be challenged by a number of runners, but perhaps foremost in her mind is Scotland's Liz McColgan, who is the hottest runner on the circuit right now. Jennings with a lot of pressure because Liz McColgan has, in the last nine months, won the New York City Marathon, set a world indoor record for 5,000 meters, as well as a world half marathon record on the roads in Japan. And McCoglin was third in this race last year, four months after giving birth. So she is back for redemption. They will both be challenged by strong teams from Ethiopia, led by Lucia Yishak and Doratar Tulu. The Kenyan team also very strong. They tied Ethiopia last year at 36 points apiece. Jane Ngotho and Susan Surma, their top runners. And they are off for this 6,000 meter race, which will consist of one start loop and then one loop around Boston's Franklin Park. Two multiple loops around the course. And Lynn Jennings knows that uh, this course favors her. She's run here since she was 14 years old, but with the snow covering it, she's not going to recognize it too well. Liz. Jennings out quickly now. About 127 women in this pack as they head for the paths. And the weather should play a major factor in the outcome of this race. It's about one degree Celsius, 33 degrees Fahrenheit. The wind 10 to 15 miles an hour. And it is cold. The snow has not melted very much. The footing has got to be atrocious out there. Just the choice of footwear would have been difficult for many of these competitors as we see the weather conditions. And what do you wear on this sort of surface? Some of the Kenyan women had originally thought of running barefoot. They obviously had to scramble and get spikes. A lot of the other athletes had to obtain longer spikes to pierce the snow. But you didn't know when they, they didn't know when they arrived this morning whether they would have icy conditions, whether the snow would have melted. It has remained hard and hard packed. Right now, Lynn Jennings up there in the front pack. Susan Surma of Kenya is right behind her. And then you see the pack stretched out. And this is going to be a real test. The past two years, the courses have been flat. Here we will see some hills. We'll see bad footing. We'll see a finishing straight into a biting wind. Well, and you see that Lynn Jennings has fallen into fourth place now, and it's going to be interesting to see her strategy. When talking with her coach, John Babington, he felt an aggressive race was the best way for Lynn Jennings to run the race. She did go out aggressively, but has now started to run a little more conservatively. Well, somewhat poetically, the leader is Martha Erston Dator of Iceland. Lynn Liz McColgan does not appear to be in the top five, and we would have thought that she would want a fast pace and would be out quickly. So McColgan not in the top pack. They are right now Martha Ernst Dator of Iceland, then it's Susan Surma, Lynn Jennings, and 251. Helen Chipnino. Interesting to see now that Jennings has settled into the pace there. Is going to work with the others to try to continue a breakaway from the rest of the pack. You know, Craig, it looks as if she looked over her shoulder, didn't see uh, Liz McColgan, and perhaps wants to take this race early. She's won the race twice with two very different strategies. There goes Liz McColgan, 164, certainly got stuck in traffic, and it's going to be almost an impossible task for her to make this make it up to the front as they get to the narrow part of the course six and a half minutes into the women's championship susan surma of kenya 
Number 255, the leader, along with 251, Helen Chip Nano. Lynn Jennings of the United States is in the pack, as is number 52, Yang Shi Kuo of China. And 321 is Albertina Diaz of Portugal. And they have separated themselves somewhat from a pack that is now starting to gain back some ground. The Kenyan women have been pushing the pace. As you mentioned earlier, they won the team title a year ago and now are running an aggressive team race up near the front. Yes, the Ethiopian team does not seem to be able to handle the conditions as well and are not showing in that front pack. Somewhat of a surprise. Lynn Jennings of the United States, of course, knows the course well. And as we get a good look at Liz McColgan, still back in the pack, moved up somewhat, but she sure is going to have a tough time on this course getting by that many runners. 6,000 meters is the distance of this race. Little less than four miles in distance, and Lynn Jennings still running up near the front. McColgan in 37th place. It is expected to be a duel between Jennings and McColgan, and Jennings working with the Kenyan women to keep the pace rolling, which is going to make it hard for McColgan to catch up. Of course, footing is a very important part of this race. At the start, some teams may have had better footing in the initial 300 yards, and perhaps uh, Great Britain's team, who was over to one side, had deeper snow to run through. The weather is cold enough and has been cold enough since this snow fell two days ago that it has not melted at all. If anything, it's been packed down by vehicles and is even more slippery in many places. Well, cross country has evolved as a sport where most of the races, major races in Europe and the United States are run on fairly manicured courses. And the athletes don't have to deal with mud, obviously don't deal with snow and ice all that much. Well, nine minutes into the race now. And the uh, leaders are in the Bear Cage Hill area, which is a long gradual climb and then a long decline. And at this point, the pack has not changed very much from what we saw after the first quarter of a mile of the race as Lynn Jennings continues to be in that lead pack, as well as Susan Surma, who has uh, been a major factor on the women's scene for the past year, winning such races as diverse as the Beta Breakers in San Francisco, as well as uh, cross country races and road races, and of course, track races. Lynn Jennings was fifth last year at the World Championships 10,000 meters. Liz McColgan, the winner of that by a large margin. And of course, she would like to uh, reverse that decision today, but it seems as if Lynn Jennings will be shifting her focus to the Kenyan women and Albertina Diaz. Uh, Craig Diaz with a good record in these championships, never a medalist, but certainly just off of that last year. And they've just passed the halfway mark. Diaz, an excellent cross country runner. You might even call her a specialist in cross country as the three women have now started to break away. What an advantage though Lynn Jennings must have. She's been running on this course for more than 16 years, first ran here as a high school student, and that had to be both a psychological and practical advantage as she knows this hilly area well, and they go, will go through the hilly area twice. One thing I think it is a psychological advantage for Lynn Jennings, she is running right now with 255 Susan Surma. One year ago, almost to the day, uh, Lynn Jennings outkicked Susan Surma. They were tied with 200 meters to go in the Nike women's race in Washington, D.C. With 200 meters to go, Lynn Jennings opened up about a 40-yard gap. So she probably feels, if it comes down to a sprint, she has Surma. Uh, of course, Surma, a streaky runner, runs a lot of races. You catch her on a good day, and she can be a, a big problem. Well, Lynn Jennings has one of the best kicks in the world, male or female. She has tremendous acceleration when it comes to the end of a race. She believes in herself. If she's with the leaders, she believes she can win. And now it seems that Diaz is the one who wants to push the pace to try to maybe take away some of the finish of Lynn Jennings. Just to reiterate, Lynn Jennings 
two years ago, took the lead at the beginning of this championship and won wire to wire. And then last year, hung into the pack. There was a pack of five with 100 meters to go, and Lynn Jennings emerged with a big kick to win that one uh, in Antwerp last year. So at this point, she seemed to do a little bit of both. She goes up to the lead and then back. Now Surma, and they will be counter punching and punching here as they are well past the halfway point. The women's race shaping up as a lot of surprises, but in the first pack, not a lot of big surprises as Lynn Jennings is trying to control the race. Albertina Diaz, who was second to Jennings in 1990, has the lead at the moment. Susan Surma of Kenya has dropped off the pack and been replaced by uh, Katharina McKiernan of Ireland, who's now about to take the lead. McKiernan is second in the World Cross uh, Grand Prix conducted around the world with a win or a medal here. She would go into the lead, $10,000 prize for that alone. And it looks as if Susan Surma is off the back of this group now. Vicki Huber of the United States is making her way through that gap between the first pack and the second pack. And you described it earlier as sort of like a boxing match. Boxers punching and counter punching with each other. That's the way the race has gone so far as Lynn Jennings was in the lead. Susan Surma was in the lead. Diaz from Portugal now making another move along with McKiernan and back and forth the race has gone. It requires great powers of concentration on the part of the athletes as they come through the stadium now. They'll make one more loop and then finish in the stadium. Takes great powers of concentration to maintain your focus and your race plan with this sort of back and forth racing. Well, with all that punching and counter punching, perhaps McKiernan, who was back a bit watching it, will have it at the end. There's Vicki Huber, 351 of the United States. This is a comeback race for her. She was sixth in the 3,000 meters in Seoul, but has been injured since then and slowly has climbed her way back up to world-class form. I think the interesting story here, though, is McKiernan as Liz McColgan, who had been expected to be with this group, is still lagging back in 34th place. McKiernan really had an excellent early season as she won cross-country events in Bolbeck, France, and in Molt, Belgium, and that really helped get her off into good position in the World Cross-Country Challenge Series. And now again, Diaz goes to the lead, so the back-and-forth running continues. So we said at the opening of the show it would be a wild day. Two big surprises already. Liz McCulgan only 34th at this time and Vicki Huber now in fourth place from the United States. And a shot a minute ago showed a number of the U.S. runners. Sylvia Mosqueda back there. Perhaps there will be some surprises uh, today in the team championships. It did not look like the Ethiopians and the Kenyans were dominating this race as they have in the past. And the cold weather and the uncertain footing may have played a role in the way the race has unfolded. When we talked with John Tracy from Ireland, who won this race two times, he said that the kind of conditions we would see today would make a big difference. It wouldn't allow the runners to run as much in a pack as they normally would do, and it really would separate out the field. Some people, he said, would run well in these conditions. Others would run very poorly. So now with less than four minutes to run, the leaders have to be thinking about their plan for the end game. And lurking off the back of that pack of three, Vicki Huber of the United States has to be an unknown factor uh, really at this point in the game. Lynn Jennings, I would say, has the strongest hand here. Two-time defending champion with a good sprint. Uh, McKiernan, perhaps not well versed in running against Lynn Jennings, although I'm sure that her sprint reputation has preceded her. And Albertina Diaz continues to make a tough attempt to not give up the lead. Well, really, when you think of it, both Portugal uh, in the form of Diaz and Ireland in the form of McKiernan both have proud cross-country running traditions. Carlos Lopez from Portugal winning the World Cross Country title twice in the period of the last 10 years. Obviously, we mentioned John Tracy 
many other great Irish distance runners who have done well in this race in the past. Lynn Jennings, part of a sh shorter history of more, uh, more recent history of American female running as we see Vicki Huber still chasing that lead group. So Vicki Huber coming up with a great race. She spent some of the winter training in New Zealand and it has obviously paid off. She has not taken part in some of the cross country races over in Europe. Lynn Jennings made uh, two, two uh, starts in Europe, winning one and losing one, but not to either of the women in this lead pack. Jennings winning uh, in the middle of January in Tourcouing, France, and losing at the Cinque Molini race in the beginning of March over in Italy. So most of the people in this crowd well aware of the story of Lynn Jennings who has handled the press uh, requests very well in the months preceding this championship. She only lives one hour from Boston. So it's been both a blessing and uh, a lot of pressure for her to have it this close to home as she goes for her third title. Well, when we spoke with her, we asked her, what was your most memorable race in your career she's had a long and successful career she said it hasn't happened yet this could well be it a course on which she won two state high school cross-country championships a course that she ran on in college and university while she was at princeton university and here she returns running for the u.s team in the world cross-country championships Diaz, number 321, was sixth in this competition a year ago. She was second in the World Cross Country Championships in 1990. Well, all right, it looks as if it's going to be left to perhaps the final 100 meters as Lynn Jennings plays it close to the vest as she had so many times before. Katharina McKinnon, McKiernan of Ireland trying to get away. Albertina Diaz has looked good every step of the way. And now they are running into a headwind just off the back, Vicki Huber of the United States. An outstanding run for Huber, as you mentioned, in a comeback effort. But now Lynn Jennings has started to test the other athletes with her finishing sprint. She looked confident. She looked as if she had a well well-timed move there as she started to move away on some firmer footing, which will allow her to use some of her turnover and her speed. 150 meters to go. They enter the stadium. 100 meters to go. Katharina McKiernan of Ireland repassing Jennings. Jennings now going to the arms. Albertina Diaz in third may be able to mount a challenge, but it's going to be win number three at home for Lynn Jennings of the United States. Katharina McKiernan will get second and Albertina Diaz will be fourth. Vicki Huber is slowing in the final straight, but it looks as if she will hold on, just barely hold on to fourth place. So the final results, Lynn Jennings of the United States with a two-second victory over Katharina McKiernan of Ireland. Albertina Diaz of Portugal gets third. Vicky Huber of the United States, fourth. In the team standings, Kenya, the winners with 47 points, the United States, 77. And Ethiopia, despite the frigid temperatures, third with 96. It is beginning to snow as the men get into the starting gate for the men's 12,000 meter World Cross Country Championships. Cross country running, I think we should make the point. As you look at Khalid Ska of Morocco, the two-time defending champion, looking up at the sky because literally in the last few minutes, the snow has begun to come down. It was sunny when they started their warm-ups, but the cloud cover has come over. The man from Morocco who lives half the year in Norway says it won't be a problem for him. Perhaps it will be for the Kenyan team. Richard Chalimo, one of the top runners. John Ngugi, the Olympic 
5,000 meter champion and Anduro Osoro who leads the World Cross Grand Prix. And they are leaning as if the start is just moments away. The U.S. team led by Shannon Butler, 463, the American 10,000 meter champion on the track, as well as Todd Williams right next to him, 469. Williams won the U.S. championships in cross country here back in November. And they are off. Snow on the ground playing a large part in the tactics of this race, you've got to have good footing in that first 200 meters because when the course narrows, if you're not in the lead group, it may be a tough day. 12,000 meters, about eight miles around the course, five multiple loops once they get out of the start area. And it is a tough day, perhaps the toughest in the 79 years that this event has been run. It's hard to say what the conditions were back in 1903, the first year when the event was held. The event was not held during certain of the war years. But the amazing thing is every possible sort of footing, every type of condition we've seen today. We've seen sun, now we're seeing snow. We see ice, we see muddy conditions in some places, and there are some grassy patches. And as you mentioned, getting out aggressively, running towards the front early on makes such a difference because part of this course, a major part of it, involves very narrow running. It's hard to pass in those narrow stretches. 54 nations attending this world championships and already a few men have gone down but they popped right back up as the battle to establish position early in the race takes form. Just past 3,000 meters of this 12,000 meter course, the leader, the lead is continually changing. 411 is Matthias Ntala Wikura, and Richard Chalimo now is taking the lead down Bear Cage Hill, back down to the flats of the course. So it's a, a Kenyan in first. And someone from Rwanda in second, not surprising, Marty, as Africans have won the World Cross Country title eight of the last 10 years. When we spoke with Mike Koski, the Kenyan coach, before the race to talk about how they would beat the man who's now in fourth, Khalid Ska from Morocco, the two-time champion, he said, it's our secret. We won't tell anybody before the race, but obviously a fast early pace is what the Kenyans had in mind. And it's Chalimo, the 19-year-old who's pushing the pace. Well, no secret uh, that Ska has had his hands full with the uh, Kenyans, both in the World Championships in Tokyo on the track and last year, he, uh, last year in Antwerp in the cross. And it looks like that's the situation again today. Ska, though, very able to defend himself in tight corners. Salimo in the lead. This is really a family affair, this World Cross Country Championships for him as his brother and sister both running in the junior competition here. Chalimo sneaks a look back. Interestingly enough, his cousin and next door neighbor is Moses Kip Tanui, the world cross country, the world steeplechase champion last year outdoors, who recently set a world indoor record in the 3,000 meters. Right, the conditions not getting any better as the snow comes down harder. Amazingly, John Ngugi, the 5,000 meter Olympic champion from Seoul is spurting, spurting into the lead now and glancing over his shoulder defiantly. Ngugi had to drop out of this race with a calf injury last year. And certainly this is the type of conditions that may result in some injuries. Now the Kenyan team only has seven runners, six men to score. If two were to pull up injured, there could be a change in what has become a regular feature of this race, and that is a Kenyan team victory. I was at the 1986 World Championships in cross country in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. The conditions were not similar to this. The footing was more secure, but there were some muddy patches. And many people thought that Ngugi's long stride wouldn't work well on that kind of turf. In fact, it worked quite well, and he seems to be negotiating the tough footing conditions here very well right now. It remains to be seen whether this is a psychological ploy on Ngugi's part, because the word was he wasn't in the greatest shape. Other men, especially other Kenyan men, have been 
faring better on the world circuit, uh, but Ngugi, as he did in 88, opens up a gap, they let him go, and sometimes he never comes back. Always dangerous, he certainly has been, as we say in America, sandbagging, playing his cards close to the vest, uh, coming into this championship, and his name was not mentioned very often as a possible winner. Googie using his long stride to go up the hills. The hilly parts of this course have to be negotiated some five times. So running hills is important in this race. A shot at the second pack. Khalid Scott trying to cover this move now, moving uh, ahead into second place, doing some of the work, breaking some of the uh, wind here himself, something he's not normally want to do but he realizes that this is a dangerous move only 13 minutes into the race well, again when we talked with some of the past winners Greta Weitz who's won the world cross country John Tracy they both said that they felt that the weather conditions particularly the footing would make it difficult for large packs to run together as they have over the last few years Ska has won the race the last two years by bursting out of a pack in the last quarter mile of the race this time, that's not going to be the situation, mainly because it's harder to run as a group. There's some narrow parts of the course. The footing is unstable. And obviously, because Ngugi has made this significant move early in the race. Well, the Kenyan strategy may not have been a team strategy. It may have been to have Ngugi. Well, they could have said, John Ngugi, we know you're not in sh great shape to win this race. If you go out fast, get Scott to go with you. The rest of the Kenyans hang back and come up and get him in the end. But right now, the first two men between them have the last six titles. And Googie, the winner for four years before Ska won the last two. John and Googie, as you mentioned, the 1988 Olympic champion at 5,000 meters. He won that championship by a big breakaway early in the race that the other athletes did not cover, threw in a lap around the sole track of about 60 seconds that opened up a large lead. In the last lap, many of the athletes came chasing after him, but it was too late. He's made a similar move here. He's put his cards on the table and, and decided to ask who would like to join me, and in this case, no one has thus far. And then Googie changing the nature of this race as you had a look back into the pack early in the race. Some of the men who were up front were Thierry Pantel of France, uh, Carol Arco of Spain was up there. I saw Steve Managhetti of Australia up in the top 15. Hamid Esabani of Morocco was up there. But since Ngugi has taken the lead, things have changed. You mentioned the tre tremendous strength of the Kenyan team in this particular championship over the last few years, but it hasn't only been here where they've been so dominant. A year ago, they did have five of the top six finishers in this race, but at the 1988 Olympic Olympics, Kenyan runners won the 800 meters, the 1500 meters, the 5,000 meters, and the 3,000 meter steeplechase. Last September in Tokyo for the World Championship, Kenyan runners succeeding at the 800 meters, the 5,000 and 10,000 meters, and again in the steeplechase. And you can see right now that in the top 10, obviously there are already, well, let's make it six Kenyans now, as 314 William Wheatball is the sixth Kenyan, uh, and he is, I believe, in the top 10. So right now, Kenya appears to be winning the team championships. Morocco with Ska and Butayev, the underdog certainly in that battle. Ethiopia does not appear to be mounting the challenge that they have in years past. Here you get a look at the distance that Ngugi has already opened on the second pack. Looks like about 50 meters at this point. That's not an insurmountable distance, Marty, and I think the fact that the second group will be able to work together may allow them to move back up towards the front. But Ngugi is the kind of runner who seems to run better when he is in the lead, when he is out ahead. He seems to feed off that feeling of being out front. Very difficult to assess how fast he is going because his stride and his turn is so long, his turnover so slow that it looks that he is out for a shot. It's interesting when you talk to the people who have worked 
with John Ngugi, both the Kenyan coaches and his agent in London. They both say that the interesting thing about this this guy is that he remains a very proud runner, but a somewhat naive runner when it comes to the traditions of athletics, track and field, cross country running, and the traditions of training. And Ngugi is an instinctive runner, a runner who likes to go out and train with distance running more than train on the track. Well, the camera lens makes it look a bit closer than it really is. It's about 60 meters back to Matthias Nawolakura of Burundi. 411, who is leading that second pack, which includes the defending uh, from, I'm sorry, Matthias is from Rwanda. That second pack containing Khalid Ska, as well as three of the other Kenyan members of the team. But Nguki is really making a big move here and making other people dance to his tune. Of course, as several races have taken place on it, has started to become a little more, more muddy. Earlier in the day, it was covered by packed snow and ice in places. Now, as more runners have gone over it with their long, up to one inch spikes on the track, there's been more and more mud created, and that will change the footing. I think we saw in some of the earlier races that what's difficult to do in these conditions is sprint, Marty, and to allow a runner to get this kind of lead early in the race is going to be difficult to get back, although, as we mentioned, the second pack, a group of five or six runners, will be able to work together and have a chance to keep their eye on Ngugi up ahead and try to close that gap as they get to the latter stages of the race. Well, we spoke about it earlier. I feel a fellow like Ngugi with a long stride taking less steps over the course has an advantage over someone like Khalid Ska, who's very short with a very quick turnover. And as you mentioned, Ska is not gonna be able to fly over the final half mile and reel people in uh, as easily as in the past. Just the fact of going around the corners on this ice, he could go down. So this race today really calls for an even pace, going out hard and running evenly. As we look at Ngugi again, making his way through perhaps the most difficult hill on the course, or undoubtedly the most difficult hill on the course, Bear Cage Hill. And I'm amazed that there is no slippage on the snow. As you mentioned, they're wearing spikes up to an inch long. They were in a panic for the past three days trying to find these types of spikes on short notice. But he appears to have no problem with the footing. Interesting discussion relating to the stride patterns because in fact you're right fewer strides wouldn't seem to make things more easy for the athlete but at the same time I think the shorter stride the efficient stride of someone like Khalid Ska will allow him to step around the equivalent of potholes the the dips in the course the peak patches of ice around whereas in Gugi he should be a little bit more unsteady especially in patches like this the long downhills where he goes wide open with his stride. You're right, a lower center of gravity. If it were an auto race, the lower center of gravity would be better on the turns, and there are a lot of sharp turns in the course. And there, in seconds, is an establishment of the lead that the Ruby has on this field. Bit of a surprise. That second group at this point does not contain uh, Andesoro. Osoro, who is one of the Kenyans who has been running the best coming into this uh, championship. And he is out of the second pack. That's a bit of a surprise. The Ethiopians also not making much of a show at the front. John Ngugi, 29 years old, member of the Kikuyu tribe in Kenya. And he, one of several Kenyans who is listed as a civil servant working for the Kenya Armed Forces. Burst on the scene in 1986 when he won the Kenyan championship in cross country and then went on to Neuchâtel in, in Switzerland to win the world cross country championship. You mentioned something of an up and down season for John Ngugi at the Nairobi International Cross Championships, which were held 
a little a little bit less than a month ago in Nairobi. He was only sixth, five Kenyans beating him. So this has not been an outstanding season for John Ngugi. But he's a man who over the last two years when he, as you mentioned last year, had to drop out and the year before did not perform up to his normal standard in the championships, has felt that he needs to regain that title. He needs to regain the top. It's the Olympic year. He'll be defending his 5,000 meter Olympic title. And this was an important race for him on the way back. There's a good look at that second group. Kalichka once again, number 340, the defending champion. And at this point, Greg, you'd have to say that Scott is gambling now that the pack, he's going to stay within the pack, and the pack will have to help him catch Ngugi. He's not going to go after him by himself. You wonder how much of Khalid Ska's talking during the week this week about not being interested in winning, how he's here simply to help the Moroccan team, that his, he is focusing on outdoor track and field, not on cross country. How much of that is really the way he was thinking, or was he, as you mentioned, sandbagging, trying to get the others off their guard? I don't believe that he uh, is here for the team. First off, I don't think they have that good of a team. Secondly, he was in Mexico City training. Uh, I saw him uh, three weeks ago when he came to Los Angeles to run a road race and missed the world best on the road for 5,000 by two seconds, uh, running 13.28. And at that time, he said he was in North America to adjust to the time change. He wanted to be ready to defend his championship. And he felt that that race, where he showed up somewhat unannounced, that that race was important to him to run. So I think he has definitely set his sights on it, even though it is an Olympic year. John Ngugi of Kenya, the Olympic champion at 5,000 meters from Seoul, winner of four straight titles in the World Cross Country Championships from 86 to 89, has taken the lead after about 3,000 meters and built up a margin of 60 meters over a second pack, which includes Khalid Ska, the two-time defending champion. And Ngugi can look back but he can't see the pack at this point. And Marty, I think the fact that the course twists and turns makes it difficult for the others to maintain a feeling of contact with Ngugi. Ngugi, a very bold move that he made to break away, but as he now heads back towards the hilly parts of the course, he can take advantage of that. He can put in spurts that will increase his lead. The other's never quite certain how far ahead he is. It makes it difficult for them to work together to try to close the margin. It is cold, it is windy, and it is snowing. And at, because of that, Khalid Ska, who tried to go with Ngugi, decided he best drop back in the pack and seek shelter. At this point, Ska has fallen out of that second pack, uh, which is three Kenyans and an Ethiopian. 29 is Steve Monaghetti of Australian, who had, Australia, who has moved his way up but it appears that Khalid Ska is moving back and not up. The Kenyan team almost assured here of a team victory. Six men count in the team scoring, lowest score wins. And in that second pack, Andoro Osaro. Also, uh, Richard Chalimo is leading Chalimo. the second group at the moment. Chalimo second at the World Championships in the 10,000 meters, a former World Junior Champion. And he led this race early on, seemed to be anxious to push the pace before Ngugi took the lead and ran away from the others. Vita Bayesa of Ethiopia, the only man really breaking up the top five Kenyans at this point. Ngugi was a bold move, as is his trademark. Same tactic that win won for him in Seoul. And I think what he always has going for him when he loses his breakaway tactic is in the weeks and sometimes months before the race. He's not running well, so everyone lets him go. And Googie's starting to lap some of the slower runners. And his long loping stride just doesn't look as if it would be very effective in cross country. In fact, it doesn't always look so effective in track. 
but Ngugi has taken to cross country. This is the event that he won four times in the 1980s, 86 through 89, and now has, seems to have returned in the 1990s to the top. Almost the exact same lead each time he's come through the stadium on the last three passes, and you'll see that five of the top six men are from Kenya. The sixth is Fida Bayesa of Ethiopia. He leads the World Cross Challenge Series, where he's won four races, so he has the maximum number of points. He's been content to let others set the pace and then have a very fast finish in those challenges. He was only third in the junior race a year ago. He's only 19. So Ngugi on his own, last lap now of the World Championships. Ska, the winner the past two years, appears to be a beaten man today. The only athletes with a chance at Ngugi are his own teammates who are now some 60 meters back. And Ngugi appears to have no problem with the footing. He's continued to look back at several points along the race, something that coaches never have liked for athletes to do. One, because it normally can serve to encourage the runners behind, and another because it's easier to fall, especially in these conditions where you never know if you're going to have a hole in the ground, if there'll be an icy patch ahead. But Ngugi has truly weathered this storm as it started to snow right before the race, and he really has looked comfortable the entire way. Well, it's snowing. It's, uh, the temperatures are dropping, and the wind has been fairly constant. 10 to 15 miles an hour. Conditions, certainly some of the, the toughest in recent memory as Ngugi attacks Bear Cage Hill for his final time. He has lapped four runners from Fiji who also were lapped, I believe, in the 1972 Olympic Games. I believe uh, Fiji had a team there that uh, was lapped on the track in 10,000 meters. Kind of unusual for it to happen here where one lap is about 2,000 meters. So Ngugi is ahead of them by about a mile and a quarter. But 60 meters behind him, his teammates are filling four of the next five spots. As you get a shot of the runners from Fiji who have got to be amazed at this weather coming from one of the most moderate climates in the world, as does John Ngugi. You have to give credit to the Kenyan athletes who were in a panic a few days ago to try and find warm enough clothes just to get out here and warm up. But once they took the sweats off, obviously the conditions were put out of their mind and the race was put into the forefront. Well, this is an important sport in Kenya. A lot of national pride involved for the Kenyans. Other countries, soccer is important in the United States, maybe baseball, basketball, but in Kenya, this is the number one sport. This is the sport that took Kenya to the world sport, the top of the world sporting ranks in the 1960s with Kip Kano and other athletes. And runners like John Ngugi are national heroes a kind of performance like this, his fifth championship, if he holds on for the victory, makes him not only one of the greatest runners of all time worldwide, but a true Kenyan hero. Now there have been men who have won this championship five times, but not many who were also uh, Olympic champions. Gaston Rolands of Belgium would have been a five-time winner and also an Olympic champion in the 3,000 meter steeplechase, but Ngugi will become a legendary athlete in this sport. Final lap now of this 2,000 meter course here at Franklin Park in Boston. $350,000 was spent to make this a cross country course worthy of the world championships, although they've been running here for over 80 years in high school, college, and open competition. But a few things were done to make this a tremendous, tremendous sight for both the spectators 
and the athletes. As you look at John Ngugi of Kenya, the Olympic champion, 5,000 meters, and now his gap is growing from 80 to 90, probably 120 meters as he closes in on the stadium. 150 yards to go for Johnny Googie, and the crowd gathered here in the stadium is getting no surprise as he's already passed by here four times with a huge lead. Closes in on his fifth victory, fifth victory getting back what he had lost for two years. Johnny Ngugi. Impressive running for Ngugi as Baeza does come up with the big sprint to fight for second place with Chalimo. Chalimo managed, no it's not Chalimo, Mutwal in the end comes up for so second. It's Mutwal, Baeza, Khalid Ska will get fourth. Steve Monaghetti will get sixth ahead of two Kenyans. So the top 10, not quite dominated by Kenya in Ethiopia as it has been in the past few years. Final results for the men. John Ngugia convincing winner over his teammate, William Mutwol. Fita Bayesa third and the defending champion of the past two years, Khalid Ska, will get fourth. In the men's team championships, Kenya the winners with one of the lowest scores ever in the history of the event.